Introducing the Live Cook Channel, a unique culinary experience delivered to your door. Co-producers Lance Gibbons and Barbara Elshove Schmidt share with us how this exciting cook-along concept came about. Tell me a little bit about how the whole iCook Channel concept uh, came about. Lockdown for me was a bit of an emotional roller coaster when I had within a week every event that we had. I remember. Function. We had a great rapport and uh, I thought, you know what, I just think this guy would really like to hear what uh, my ideas that I have and how we can pivot through lockdown. So I gave him a call and I told him that I had this idea of doing virtual corporate events. And one of those virtual corporate events included a, a cooking event because what better way to connect people and bring people together than through cooking. Putting the program together and, and dealing with the chefs and, and seeing just how much travel the, the restaurant industry was going through. And it was great for us to be able to bring both Barbara's skills of corporate meetings and putting people together and our understanding of the industry from as a chef to be able to create a recipe that could actually work, that could help everybody involved. The idea is that you will now be able to click and cook alongside your favorite chef as they produce their own signature dishes right in your kitchen or your living room. A fantastic new uh, initiative. I'm so excited to be part of it. And tonight is gonna be filled with fun. And of course, the chef who's gonna take us through it all today is none other than the fantastic Franck Dondre. Is it iCook or is it Live Cook? How, how did you come up with the name? So the name has been an interesting journey, starting out with iCook Channel, which was the idea that people would be watching and cooking from the iPads or the iPhones. But as the show has progressed and developed, we realized that actually, we're actually a live streaming show, which sets us apart from anybody else. So we are Live Cook, channel and we're showcasing in real time a demonstration by a chef having those ingredients delivered to your door where people get to enjoy the cook a lot and we have a presenter who's going to field questions so it's completely interactive and completely engaging and entertaining and there's a lot more that we're going to be adding to this channel so stay tuned so turnips it's a beautiful autumn slash winter veg that i'm going to use in that salad so it's quite interesting because when you, you, I actually use a paring knife to slice the turnips um, because it's it's quite an odd vegetable. It's got almost like two skins. It's got quite a thick skin. So yeah. if you use a peeler, you're just going to have to run it twice. Tell me a little bit about the personality that is Pete Goffwood and why you chose him as the presenter for the show. So actually, when we were discussing who we were going to cast for our first episode my team orange events company being at Nora farm village frank dangero came to mind and while i was kind of looking at images and how we could kind of start working on the brand of the channel there was a lovely picture of, of frank and pete together and i brought this to the attention of lance and that's what actually was the decision to have them do the first episode because the relationship between the chef and the presenter is actually of vital importance for this show because there must be that personality and that relationship must come through. So we contacted Pete and he was delighted about the concept and we're 100% on board and have been unbelievable when it came to putting the concept into reality. For me, just looking at your individual plate, I have to also say that for me, when I cook at home, I very seldom do individual plates. I prefer big bowls and big platters that people can pass around. It's more that sort of conviviality of the table. I think for me, individually plated food, unless you're, unless you're doing soup, is, 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 is for restaurants. Whereas eating at home with family and friends, yeah. I like that, that passing around and tearing the bread and pouring a big jug of uh, uh, oh. dressing around and I think it's far more fun and part of the part of the meal than, than attending to your own little individual plate. What has the response been so far to the first episode? How have people been receiving the concept? 
it's been absolutely so heartfelt all the responses that we've received from the images and the comments have been flooding in even to this day of father and sons cooking together families cooking together even f grandparents and grandchildren that haven't been able to see each other they've been cooking the meal together and then jumping onto a zoom call afterwards and showing their dish uh, with each other and book clubs coming together, a date nights, photographs of couples having a surprise anniversary dinner. We had gift vouchers for birthdays that were delivered to Pretoria from uh, your friend in Cape Town. Next thing this box arrives and here's your ticket and you know, and, and all those experiences were shared with us. And I then realized something in that moment, I realized that actually we are not in the business of just a channel. Our channel is actually in the business of creating memories and experiences. And it's about connecting people. And although they had all these people were all separately in their homes cooking together with Frank, I actually felt a huge sense of community, a huge sense of togetherness with all these people that were cooking from all over and it was beautiful. Frank, I'd like to raise a glass and say thank you very much. It's been stunning watching you cook. Um, adieu, and thank you very much, people. Hi, and welcome to the Live Cook channel. I'm Pete Gofford, your host. We're two episodes in, and as you can see, we've changed our name. We had a rethink about what it is we do here, and we are certainly a live cooking channel. You get to tap in live to cook with some of the finest chefs in the country. So we thought Live Cook channel more appropriate to what we're about. So here we are, second episode, our next fantastic chefs. And if you thought we were cooking with the finest world this evening, we are certainly cooking with, to my mind, the finest chef in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we will be cooking with Luke Dale Roberts. Luke, how's it going, dude? Great, Pete. Good to see you, man. Very excited to be here and uh, over the moon to be cooking again. Great stuff. Well, we've got a couple of bits of housekeeping to take care of before we crack on. Luke's great to see you again. And I'm looking forward to cooking via the internet with you this evening, although... You get to do the cooking, and I'm just going to have to imagine how fab the dish is because there's no one at the back here cooking for me, unfortunately. Anyway, a few special mentions. Firstly, to all of those fathers who got this as a gift, well done, dads. Um, just because you got the box as a gift does not mean you have to do the cooking, although I'm sure that was the idea. I think you should be allowed to put your feet up, glass of wine in hand, and someone else should be cooking to you. Then we've got a 15th birthday shout out to uh, Connor Haybram. Nice one, Connor. Happy birthday. And of course, welcome to the Retail Capital Leadership Group. Carl and his fellow people who are welcome tonight, who are joining us live. Nice to have you on board, guys. And thank you very much for the sterling work you're doing during lockdown for the restaurant industry. Now, before we get cracking, we have some people to thank who make this this whole experience possible. Firstly, to Haikem, and then secondly, to Food Guru. Food Guru is a fantastic new restaurant mobile app um, and, and, and platform. If you want to see their more, if you want to see more of what they're about, look at foodguru.ai. But ostensibly, it's going to change the face of how restaurants 
restaurants interfacing with their with, with, with their clientele from now on. Um, they're also building a massive uh, a backup section that will help restaurants integrate into the new legislation when it arrives about social distancing, taking temperatures, cleaning protocols, both back of house, kitchen, um, and, and the restaurant itself. And, and I, I think this can be a fantastic aid. So this episode this evening is brought to you by Food Guru. Great, and we're back. So, Luke, it's fantastic to actually be cooking with you virtually. We've, we've done a number of dinners and eat out the walls and lots of stuff like that where we've cooked side by side, but we've never actually done it over the internet. How is the whole lockdown treating you? Uh, it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster, to be honest with you. I mean, it's been great because I've got to spend more time with my family, with my wife and my boy, Finney. He's now 13. He's a big boy now. Um, and we've had a brilliant time. And then, you know, we were hatching ideas all the way through and changing the goalposts as things, you know, transpired and, and news came through. And, and now, you know, we're busy with these um, hampers and the deli from the test kitchen and we're doing the potluck at home from upstairs, which has been good because I've managed to integrate the majority of our staff back into the kitchen and front of house and they're earning money again, which is, you know, basically that is the, the uh, essence of what we're trying to do is keep people in employment and earning a bit of money. Yeah, look, I think that's, that's all about, and, and I, I, I lord a lot of the chefs who are doing it. I don't think people realize that, that it's not covering overhead. Uh, and this home delivery stuff and the things that pe the chefs are doing is primarily to take care of staff. They're not pocketing loads and loads of money because they have no overheads. It really is just about making sure that your staff can put food on the table. And it's, it's, it's definitely to be lauded and appreciated. OK, so before we get stuck in, I think we need to um, we need to just take care of some business. Um, first things first, for those of you who are just joining or uh, jumping in the live feed. This is how the Live Cook channel works. We have every two weeks some of the finest chefs in the country and they are going to cook their signature dish for you. You go to web tickets, you click on, you say how many people are in your house on pay for your box and on the day, Daily Dish will deliver your box box full of locally sourced ingredients and the appointed time six o'clock you click on to click on to your youtube link and you cook alongside the presenter and your favorite chef and we will take you through a fantastic evening's entertainment hopefully a damn fine meal to boot but this is interactive and we want to make it as interactive as possible in order to do so we need your help give us some comments if there are any questions you want to ask You've got the comment section below here on YouTube. And if you want to send us something on Twitter, you can use the hashtag live cook channel. But we want to keep this. It's almost like having a live audience, but we need some feedback for our live audience in order to make it as real as possible for you guys. If we're going too fast, you want us to slow down, send us a message. Okay, so Luke, I think it's time to, to, to put our people out of our misery, although I think they've got their box. But for those who have just signed in, what's on the menu for tonight? So tonight, Pete, we're cooking beef wellington, one of my favorite autos. Um, it's a fancy little thing, and we're cooking individual portions as opposed to all the good stuff. Um, but before I walk you through the box, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping myself, Pete. Cool. Excellent. Let us know. 
sanitizer. Hi, Kim. Sanitizer. I'm going to sanitize my workstation. Good man. There you go. All important. I've got to clean days. everything. Exactly right. So kill all the bacteria and just work super clean. I'm going to sanitize myself with this hand sanitizer. I'm going to spray a little bit on here just so I smell nice on <laughs> the show. Little dab will do right, you. All clean. Exactly right. All clean. Um, so next up. So Luke, let's 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 go through our box of ingredients. So just just as as Luke's preparing himself to do that, this folks for those of you watching online, this is what the ticket holders get that you miss out on. If you want to join in this experience, remember go to Web Tickets next time and book for the next chef in two weeks. But these are the ingredients that have been delivered to our ticket holders' door. This is what they're going to be cooking this evening. Take it away, Luke. Yeah, off we go. So I've got onions garlic, fresh thyme, and mushrooms. So that is going to make your mushroom duck cell. Mushroom duck cell is a fancy French word for a good old-fashioned mushroom stew. We're going to cook it down, a little bit of cream, some sherry, make it delicious. Right, next up. You've got your beautiful fillet of beef that's been pre-portioned for you. you got some pancetta, which is a, a highly, um, like a, a nice cured bacon, but it's cured right the way through. So it's quite firm. And that's going to act as, a, as almost like an insulation between your mushrooms and your puff pastry. So your puff pastry doesn't get too soggy. Um, then obviously the puff pastry you've got in the box we're going to keep that in the fridge very important if you can keep all your ingredients in the fridge and we'll just take them out of the fridge as we go that will be helpful then you've got the base to your sauce you're going to use a, a little bit of onion as well some black pepper this is the mega mix here which is basically a combination it's called cafe la base it's a combination of some secret ingredients on that tell you exactly what they are. It's a little bit of uh, brandy, some red wine, some uh, marmite. You've got some Worcester sauce in there, some soy sauce, all the good stuff. This is going to give it some nice body. Then you've got a sachet of cream, a large sachet of cream here. This is the sachet we're going to use for us. And the small sachet of cream, which is somewhere in here is going to be used for the duck cell. Okay, so that's a little walkthrough on your box. Okay, so look, just before we get before we get cracking with this, um, this is one of my, I must admit, this is one of those nostalgic dishes that, 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 that takes me back to, to a kid. My grand. What made, what, made you, what made you choose this particular dish? I just love it. It's again, it's a nostalgic one, you know. It's it, it used to, my mum used to cook it on Sundays sometimes, only for special treats though. Like it's it's a it's it's a more luxurious Sunday Sunday roast than your your normal ones. And um, I did a pub kitchen here. I did it. It was called Ye Old Test Kitchen, and we did like a pub pop up last season or last winter. And um, the best, the most popular dish was the beef Wellington. And every, I think everyone can relate to it, you know. So I wanted to do something comforting in these troubling times, you know, something that warms the cockles of your heart. I think people forget how comforting food like that can be when you when you have something that that sort of ticks boxes and hankers back to to, to more wonderful, less troublesome times. And I, and I think I think the more exactly. the chefs use those dishes and, and put them in a more modern 
uh, modern restaurant idiom that the, the better would be. And I think there's tons of dishes exactly like that, that people really do hanker for and they want it made properly. I mean, they want it made, they want that extra level of expertise that the chefs will be able to bring to it. Exactly right. And I feel like that's where my food's going now. You know, it's going more to that comforting, nostalgic, uh, something that people can immediately relate to. Um, and I feel that's the way food's going in general. You know, people, I think, have experienced long menus that are, you know, kind of like multi-sensory and involve a lot of thinking, a lot of communication. And I feel that um, going forward, certainly my style will be a little bit more nostalgic, a little bit more uh, simple. And um, yeah, but who knows? I might change my mind tomorrow. I, I, I don't keep an idea for yeah. too long. Yeah, but also, uh, but I think you're right. I think I think you know, there's there's one thing for 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 restaurants to take us on a journey of discovery, but you kind of want to make sure that every now and again you center yourself, so that everyone understands where it is you began from, where your roots were, and 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 sometimes, as I said, that that those dishes, the Irish stews, the bourguignons, the cockavans of this world just need to be shown for the beautiful food that they actually were. And sometimes it takes restaurant chefs to, to reinvent them, to, to revisit them, to get people to realize that the, those classics have been around for ages and there's a reason for that because it's, it's just damn good cooking. Exactly. Exactly right. Cool. Well, okay, look, I think, I think let me just check on my... Um, we've been waiting for some couple of people to join us. We had we had a little bit of confusion that, of two links, but I think we're we're ready to rock and roll. Um, everybody knows or should know by now to please make sure that your oven is at two hundred degrees. Um, and if you've got, particularly using solid plates, electrical stove, you might want to make sure you get your pot of water on the go now, so we can blanch your beans later. Any, um, what sort of ing uh, utensils are we going to need today, uh, Luke? I think, I think one of the cameras is looking down at my little setup here. So I've got a cutting board, a good knife, a paintbrush, spatula, some tongs, some spoons. I've got an egg that I've separated, the salt and pepper, and a pair of scissors to cut the little bags open, and a couple of baking trays that are lined with nonstick um, greaseproof paper. Okay, great. Well, we take it as read that people know that their oven is on, their puff pastry is in the fridge. Um, I reckon, you know, my stomach already thinks my throat's been cut, so I, I want to see you cooking some food for um, Luke's. So I reckon it's, let's kick off. Good, let's do it. So, first up, I'm going to go right back to the basics. Onions. So, onions for me, particularly in French cooking, they're what I call the flavor builder. When you cook your onion, uh, you're either going to saute it, giving it some color, or you're going to sweat it, uh, which is basically cooking without color. And that's going to be the point in the cooking process when we draw out flavor. So I want to show you all how to chop an onion. This might seem like very basic, but there's a rule to it and it's very important. So if you look at an onion, you've got the root and you've got the tip. You're going to cut through that onion, through the roots and through the tip lengthways. So you're not peeling it yet. Okay, cool. right. Okay, then you're going to take the tip off about a half a centimeter in of both halves. And then you need to have a little waste bowl or a little plastic bag or paper bag or whatever. Then next up, we're going to peel that skin away, but we're going to keep the roots intact.
and then you're going to cut Sorry, Luke, just to jump the in. skin right next to the root. So the root is going to hold that onion together. Luke, just a question. Let's Any repeat for the other half. Not making your eyes water while you're chopping onion. Sorry, Pete, can you just say that again? I said, any secrets on not having your eyes water while you chop onions? Okay. Well, I always think if you keep your onions in the fridge, then they obviously don't, um, they don't release that, that smell as quickly as they would do if they were room temperature. Mm -hmm. So I keep onions in the fridge. I think my tear ducts are all blocked up, though, from year peeling onions, Pete. Yeah. Yeah. We've become so insensitive. <laughs> I'm, emotion I know, I'm emotionally devoid of any compassion or feeling. <laughs> right, back to business. So we're going to slice. I'm going to use the, the chopping board camera. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to slice two thirds of the way up the onion from the tip side to the root side. And I'm going to slice very finely. But the root is going to keep that onion intact. This is the first thing you learn at college when you go to catering college, how to chop an onion. And then they start passing the first aid box around. <laughs> I'm sure you remember those days, eh, Pete? Oh, indeed. My fingers used to be a lot longer than they are now. <laughs> okay, so you've gone through, you can see, it's almost like a concertina. Yeah? And then we're going to slice horizontally twice approximately half a centimeter from the base and approximately half a centimeter from that again only two-thirds of the way through the onion to the root right then the next cut is going to be a, a, a diameter it's going to go across the diameter so you've cut from tip to root now you're going to cut across in thin slices and you should have what we call in french cooking a brunoise or fine dice of onion coming off your knife there you go can you see that okay so just just a quick question luke i know we started with the onion what which uh, which part of the dish which part of the recipe we st are we beginning with so we're actually we're going to make the mushroom duck cell first which okay is, cool it's, which is a little bit of stew it starts with the onions a little bit of mm -hmm. thyme some seasoning some garlic i've got a quick a question here from vanessa used as well as or an onion, onion. Cool. Either. Shallots are a little sweeter. I love a good shallot, I must say. Yeah. Not very easy to get hold of, unfortunately. No. Okay, next, I'm going to repeat for the other half of the onion. Can you see how I'm holding my fingers, Pete? Well, I'm, I'm actually using yes. them as a guide for my knife. It's almost like that sort of tiger claw kind of vibe that you've got going there. Exactly right. Okay, my horizontal cuts. And my diameter cuts. Lovely. Okay, let's put them in a little bowl. 
and just give our chopping board a little wipe down for the next stage. Okay, Luke, while you're doing that, we're just going to remind our viewers who, 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 are, who are ardently following you and now are going to start cleaning their boards in anticipation of carry on. We're just going to go to a quick of our fantastic sponsors who bought this episode to us today, and that's Food Guru. We're back. Right, Luke, let's crack on. Garlic. We're going to crush garlic the restaurant way now. So, garlic clove down, skin on, and then crush it with the side of your knife. Then you should be able to release the peel. Then you're going to chop through it finely. Not the same way as the onion, just go run your knife through it because we're going to use salt and as, as an abrasive agent to crush it. It's also going to draw all that nice garlic flavor out. Let's take a piece of stalk, approximately half a teaspoon. Sprinkle that on top of the, the garlic. So you've got a little pile of roughly chopped garlic with some salt on top. Now, put your knife down and put your, your, your index finger and middle finger on the tip of the knife and then just run over the garlic in a kind of crushing motion. Can you see that's just, um, just... Sorry, Pete. Sorry, I'm just, while you're chopping the onion, uh, the garlic, there are two things. First, a question about smelly fingers and any, any tricks not to have your hands reek of garlic for the rest of the evening. I like the smell of garlic. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna wash my hands. I'm gonna sanitize, of course, but I'm not gonna wash my hands. Um, but I That's heard a, a little birdie that. told me that if you actually get a stainless steel knife and then you just run it over, like run your hands over the the stainless steel knife, obviously not the blade side, and underwater. Pete, do you want to just elaborate on that? Yeah, it, I tell you what, I, it, it, someone told me, I said, that nonsense. You just take a normal normal chef's knife and run it under the, under cold water and just run your hands, whatever you, whatever surface in your hands have come in contact with the garlic, and you rub it on a, on a, on a stainless steel knife and shoom, the smell goes. I don't know the science behind it. It's something to do with oxidation. In fact, you can actually buy in some, in some um, uh, home stores these little stainless steel bars of soap you keep on your – and you actually – There we go. Nikita Buxton says, rub your fingers on the bottom of stainless steel sink. Excellent. A quick question just related to the onion you were chopping, Luke. Um, are yeah. we using all of that onion for the duke cell, or is that, a, or, or are you just chopping the whole thing in advance now? I'm going to use all that onion for the duck cell, and I've got two small baby onions that I'm going to use for the sauce later, and another clove of garlic. Okay, perfect. Okay. Cool. That was just a question we had from the audience. Right. So your garlic, nicely crushed. Put that into the bowl. Oops. 
next time something we've cool. got plenty of these days <laughs> I couldn't resist it, man. <laughs> right, you're going to pick the time off. So thumb and thumb and forefinger, you're going to just draw the little leaves off of the time and put that in with your onions. That's going to add character. I'm only going to use half the time because I want to save some of that beautiful flavor Ooh. for the sauce later. Yeah. As well. And I can only assume because I can only see half the question. Is crushing garlic this way better than, than using a garlic crush? Um, I think a garlic crush is just as good, eh? It's, but That's how we yeah. do it in the restaurant because garlic crushes would last about... 15 minutes in a, in a normal kind of restaurant, it would get broken. So we, we do everything with our best friend. <laughs> yeah, makes perfect sense. Right, so you've got your little bowl there, look. Onions, garlic, thyme. Now let's grab our mushrooms. Right, give them a little rinse under the sink, okay? It's, uh, you just want to rinse off some of that, you know, compost. It's not going to kill you, but let's just rinse, okay? I did that without even moving. Oh, no. Uh, are you cheating, Luke? To have an assistant in your kitchen? I most certainly do, eh? The fabulous car. <laughs> well played. Well played. Right, take the stalk. Take, take a little. Um, I was, yeah. I, I need. I need a. It's like my insecurity blanket. I need a, someone to to lean on if I start folding. And I'm worried. I've got three laptops, <laughs> you know, around me, and and um, I'm feeling quite tech tech uh, vulnerable. <laughs> right, take this take just a little bit take a little bit of uh the stalk off and then you're going to run through your your mushrooms we're going to chop these slice first and then chop through right this can be as coarse or as fine as you want it to be. I used to love cutting mushrooms when I was training because it's one thing that you can cut really fast. It's a good way of showing off, I must admit. It I is, often, isn't it? I often, if I'm doing demonstrations, chop onions and mushrooms that don't even belong in the recipe, just to be flash. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all about the show, Pete, eh? Always. <laughs> so we decided to do this at the test kitchen. So in a very big, empty, quiet kitchen today but it just it just feels like a controlled environment you know and and you know chefs yeah. are all quite controlling so right right so you can see that i'm just going to cut through that once more so i've got like a a relatively fine dice of mushroom Okay, then into a bowl. 
wipe your board down. And just get the sherry and the little sachet of cream out of your box and snip off the tops of those, please. You might just want to stand them in a cup so they don't, you know, pour all over the place. Now, and I'm going to get a small panel. See, this is the stove camera. We got a camera right above the stove as well. So this this pan is approximately twenty centimeters in diameter. It's what we call a little saute pan. I'm going to put the gas on, mm -hmm. and my gas needs to be on a medium heat at this point in time. So if you're cooking on electric, I would say number six or seven. Because we know electric doesn't do much okay. before it gets to six or seven. Right. Butter. Let's put a good the most important tablespoon. Pop that in the pan. Let it melt down. I'm seeing a question, Luke, um, from Nikita going, what would be the perfect wine to pair with this dish? Ah, I think a good a good cab sav, you know, with lots of body in it. Um, something something mm -hmm. you can just kick back with and put in the middle of the table. Okay, that sounds like an excellent idea. In fact, I'm I'm drinking a little Cab Sav blend as we speak. Uh, Gentle Giant from Spa 2014. Merlot, Petit Vidot and Cab Sav blend. Um, huh? Bloody delicious, actually. I'm going to stay off the wine. I'm just going to have to imagine that you things <laughs> right um i did see a comment saying i need to slow down a little bit what i'm going to do is i'm going to get these onions cooking and the mushrooms and then we can reconcile in maybe five minutes we can just see where everyone's at um so my onions go into the pan you can see the butter is melted onions in garlic time right and then a little pinch of salt give that a little stir and then get it on the heat what we're going to do now is we're going to sweat these onions Pete and this is again the flavor building part of the process where we're going to draw out the flavor from the thyme and the garlic and the salt in there will draw that flavor out so you're building flavor now on the heat just let that dry away gently we don't want to give it color okay okay so your mushrooms are done While that's happening, I'm just going to top and tail my beans. Cool. So, a packet of beans. Is, is, is there any other? Is there another veg you could use for this if you if you were a bean fan? You could use broccoli. I, I love sprouting broccoli. Uh, Mange too. Uh, you could you could put. I mean, I would love a little. Roast potato on the side as well with my beef Wellington. But um, mm -hmm. you got starch in the pastry, so it's not a, essential. Yeah, because you can never go wrong with a good roast potato, though. Well, and we were saying the other night, it's actually the hardest thing to do in a restaurant, a good roast potato, because you 
so many people yeah. have eaten them at home and they literally they come out of the oven they slightly stuck you're able to just like ease them off and they got that perfect crunchy you know flat texture on mm. them um to to do that in a restaurant is very hard it's very very difficult i think that there are certain things in restaurants that are just impossible to do and i think it's also it's the same as roasting a perfect chicken you know that's one of the, one of my favorite dishes of all time and best done at home because restaurants just it's all about timing i think more than anything else you know you, you it yeah. takes so long to do something like that get right potatoes right they literally yeah. have to go from the oven to the table when they're ready you can't do it on demand for 10 or 15 tables at different times just there's certain things that restaurants just cannot get do better than you can do at home exactly and they're the things that people relate to the most so they're almost the most risky things so in that point of fact sometimes the simpler the, the dish the less there is to hide behind you know very true huh? i think people forget that simple cooking is the hardest thing to do it, it starts with the shopping you know you that old that old saying that you can't make a, a, a silk purse out of a sour's ear it, it holds true for cooking if you start with dodgy ingredients you're never going to get you're never going to, isn't it, the, the, the dish is never going to rise to the occasion if you if you start with crap. Exactly right. So listen, I've got a question here. Mushrooms not with onion. We're just cooking the onion garlic time at the moment. We're going to add the mushrooms when that um, onion is softened. In the meantime, we're just taking the, the stalky bits off the beans. I've lined them all up like soldiers. And I'm going to cut through them in one go and I'm going to take off the stalk part and I'm going to leave the tip because that's quite tasty. There's nothing wrong with the tip of a bean. So if you turn around to your, if you turn around to your onions, they should have started frying gently. There you go, they're softening in the butter. I've carried away, I've got a little bit of color on mine, but that's fine. I just don't want to brown them completely. Let's finish these beans quickly, then we can turn around and concentrate on our onions. Stalks off. There you go. Let's put our beans in a bowl for later. Then we've done a bit of groundwork. Right, I'm going to wipe my board down again. And this stuff um, I think, Philippe, if you accidentally, uh, this is a quick question. I think uh, if you accidentally add the mushroom with the onions, it's not a train smash. Um, I think the idea is just to get more flavor and soften the onions in the garden onions. before you add the mushrooms. But if you put them all together, it's, it's not a problem. It's not a train smash. Exactly. Let's not throw the baby out with the bath water, eh? There we go. Right. Um, turn around to my um, Lauda Conaway said, is it OK if my first what bottle of wine is done? I think that's more than acceptable. I think that's par for the course. Right. So I'm just going to turn my heat up very slightly because obviously mushrooms can take water. And they're going to start giving off their, their natural water. And I want to fry that off. Is everyone seeing what I'm doing? Let's get our, our pot. Let's get our pot with the water just simmering very gently as well. Eh? Shit, 
Kerry and cream will go in a little bit later when the mushrooms have finished cooking. Right, I'm cooking for four and I've got 200 milliliters of sherry here. I'm actually going to drop that quantity and give myself a glass. So, excellent idea. Sherry, exactly, you got to make do where you can, eh? <laughs> right, so my mushrooms are frying, they've let off some of their water. I'm going to put Half of that quantity of sherry in. And the other half. I think it's 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 invaluable to make sure that the chef is suitably libated during these cooking um these cooking um, um demonstrations i think uh, mainly because we don't um we don't get to cook when we uh, don't get to drink while we cook professionally so i think it's more than acceptable to be having a glass of wine or two now under these circumstances because during a normal service you have to keep your wits about you exactly right and it's never a good look the head chef swilling wine whilst playing Eating up busy restaurant. It's although I mean it could be perceived as a good I, I did, you know. Yeah, I did work with a guy once who shall remain nameless, who used to have a big coffee mug that he used to fill with ice and then fill with one of those overmere bot the 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 cellar car, the the boxes and he used to fill it up and he used to have it on the pass the whole evening, just this massive coffee mug filled with cheap nasty wine. He'd have it on from, he'd have it during breakfast, he used to hotel chef. He'd have it on during breakfast service and the entire day he'd have this mug of white wine with him. I just want to draw your stove. I've turned my heat up to full now. I've got quite a lot of liquid that I need to boil dry. So this is what we call a reduction. Mm -hmm. I'm reducing the liquid, which means I'm boiling it off and I'm intensifying flavor. So that has to boil hard. For about six, seven minutes. Right, let's get a little bit of housework done again, eh? Let's open up this beef fillet. We got a question there, Pete. Um, uh, Mr. Mushrooms, we're in a different. Yeah, it'll still deglaze. Yes. I'm taking my beef out. Place these little steps. I need a, a kind of rectangle shape. And you know what you can do? You can actually make a nice tartare out of the trimmings or stroganoff. Use the, the trimmings with a bit of the duck cell tomorrow and make a little stroganoff. Excellent idea. Right, look, I'm just going to square this off. Right, I'm going to recap. Right, squared off. Repeat four times. There's a little rectangle I've got. I'm recapping. I've got my onions, my garlic, my thyme sweating. I've added the mushrooms. I've added the on sherry. I'm rich now. And I'm going to boil it until it's almost dry before adding my cream. I've taken my beef out of his packet and I've squared it off. So it's a nice rectangle shape. You can see them there. 
little rectangles. All right, let's season the beef. Turn around. It's almost boiled dry. They're behind us. Two minutes. Whilst that's boiling, I'm just going to put some salt and pepper on my beef. Uh, Luke, just a question, a quick question about salt. Do you have any salt preferences? I know, I know different kinds of salt have become popular these days. Do you, do you have any preference to salts that you use? I use modern salt. I find you've got a lot more control over it when you're seasoning things. And it's, it's mm -hmm. funny to say it's not as salty as, as iodized table salt. Yeah. Right. It's almost boiled dry. My beef ready. Let's get a frying pan. And let's start getting that hot because this needs to be red hot. I can hear the mushrooms, they're starting to sizzle a little bit, which means I've poured off that liquid. Luke, can I ask a favor? Like. Yeah. Luke, can I ask a favor? Can you swap the, the, the pot so you can put your beans in your frying pan over so we can see what happens in the frying pan? Yeah, absolutely. I'll do that now. Right, so mushrooms are boiled dry. I'm adding the cream. The small sachet of cream, not the big sachet. That goes back on the heat. Give it a little stir. There we go. Lovely. How thick do we want that, Luke, the, the ragu? We want it. We want it to be quite thick. So it needs to boil down again. It needs to reduce, but it mustn't fry mm -hmm. because the minute it starts frying, okay. the, the the cream will split. Split, and we want it to remain homogenized. Okay, that makes sense. That's already starting to thicken up. Get your tray ready, and what you're going to do once that's once that's cooked and thickened up nicely, you're going to pour it and flatten it out on a tray and pop it in the fridge because we're going to cool the whole thing down. Could we just, if we didn't have a tray, could you just do that on a plate? If it's just use a plate. Right, right that's reduced now. Look, can you see, uh, Pete? Yeah, lovely. Just, just a quick question: If you didn't have a tray to put that on, could you just put that on on a, on a plate and then and then flatten it out? Absolutely. It's, all you're doing is you're just flattening it out so it cools quicker, Pete. You cool it down. Cool. Right, that goes in the fridge. You want to get it cold as quickly as possible. Right. Hot. Everyone's frying pan should be hot now. What we're going to do next is we're going to sear the beef. So it's actually sealing it. We're not frying it. We're not cooking it. We're just sealing the outside of it to lock flavor and moisture into the beef. Mm -hmm. Oil, veg oil, 
for olive oil. Right, I'm cooking on vapor. I'm not gonna cook on a smoking pan because I don't wanna start a fire, but I wanna see the oil separating and I wanna see a vapor coming off of it. You need okay. your tongs and you've got four sides to your piece of beef. It's, it's a rectangle. So you're gonna seal each side. Okay, uh, Luke, do me a favor, before you get the meat in the pan, Luke, before you get the meat in the pan, don't you want to just give us a quick yeah. recap? A couple of people saying they're, 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 they're lagging behind a little bit. Just to give us a, a quick recap before we get into the meaty part of the section, just as to where, where they should be now. Right, so we should, we should have um, put our onions, garlic, and thyme into the pan and sweated them. We added the mushrooms turn the heat up, fried it off a little bit. Then we added half of our brown sherry and we reduced that to... I see an interesting question here before we actually get to the beef. And it, and it says here that is, is, um, isn't is reverse searing these days something that's quite popular? And I said that, that while that's definitely the case, um, you can't reverse sear something that's wrapped in pastry. No, I know. I've heard about this reverse searing, um, but I'm too old to change my ways, eh? Yeah. And also, you couldn't I do like it in a Wellington, a can you? Sear. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. But I think I, what I like is like a hard sear. So if I'm cooking a big steak on the bright, I'll cook it hard on both sides, get the color in there, then I'll move it somewhere cooler and then slowly cook it through and then it will take it up to that nice, perfect cooking degree. And I think you also, if by reversing, you also miss when you kind of sear that seasoning into the steak or the, whatever the joint of meat you're, when, when you get that initial hard, hot contact, it bakes that salt and that pepper onto the meat, which you don't get when you reverse sear. Exactly right, exactly right. I, I actually heard about this reverse searing this weekend. And um, I mean, just goes to show I live under a rock. I'm quite happy with the, <laughs> the way we do it now. Yeah, I know. But also, I think it, it, it comes a lot from, from the, the whole business of sous vide where people are cooking it through and then finishing it off in a pan afterwards. But I think now we're ready for our steak. Oh, Mike Bolton, what do you do with the rest of the sherry? We drank it. Right, um, beef. I'm gonna start searing it off gently. No, I'm gonna start searing it off firmly. Not gently. <laughs> firmly, aggressively. Yeah. Okay. okay, just to clarify while you're doing that, but the, the, the reverse forget. searing question has raised its head again. You, you don't seal, seal in the juices. It's impossible to actually seal in the juices. What, what, what we're doing by browning in the pan is we're giving that caramelized crust that's so in, important to the beef. The, it, it's not scientifically possible to actually seal in the juices because the cells themselves burst when, they, when they're faced with heat. So they naturally reduce the juices. The whole idea of browning something in the pan is to give added caramelization, that that malleard effect, which adds to the, the beefy richness of the dish. Good one. The malleard effect. I'd, I'd completely forgotten what that was called. Thanks, thanks, Pete. <laughs> I just Googled it quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen all four sides now. I'm going to do two, and then I'm going to pop them on a tray or a plate, and I'm going to put them in the fridge as well. And why would you do that, Luke? It's about 15 seconds. Per side. I want to and why are you going to put them in the fridge? So I want, 
I'm going to cool it down because I'm working with puff pastry and I want everything to be as cold as possible when that pastry comes into contact with it. Makes perfect sense. Right, while that's happening, let's open up our pancetta. I just wish I could be with all 150 people at the same time now, giving them a helping hand if they're not quite keeping up or anything. But I think everyone's doing great. No, look, I think I think we'll, they'll be okay. I think um, they're, 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 most of them are caught up by now. Um, and also, once we get the beef in the oven, there's also time to recap and for people to uh, um, uh, to, to, to take stock of where they are. There's more people asking us, asking when you drank the leftover um, sherry. Uh, the answer is yes. So okay, so so th th what's happening now with the pancetta? You're just going to lay that. What's that? Four strips per portion, Luke. Uh, just, clearly, four strips. Out, I think uh, we're going to do per, three per portion. Three per portion. Okay, that's cool. Um, what I'm doing is I'm making a little. Bit of Okay, perfect. So that's kind of each one of those is for a portion of beef. Correct. Exactly right. So it's three per portion. Okay. And and you don't need to use the pancetta. It's it's not a vital part of the ingredients. So if you if you have dietaries where you can't eat pork, just leave it out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. I've always seen. I've always seen that uh, another I'm traditional. Four when you need two. Another I thing know. that also works I'm nicely sure. if you're not going to use. Another thing that also works nicely if you're not going to use the pancetta or if you you don't eat pork, is to use um, blanched spinach leaves. That works quite nicely. A little bit of blanche Swiss chard or something like that. You can actually yeah. pat it down. You can roll your book cell and everything up there without using the the pancetta if it was a problem. Okay. Well, even like, I mean, in the old days, we used to make little pancakes, you know, like thin crepes and then oh, roll wow. them, roll thin crepes. crepes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would really Sorry. seal the moisture in completely. It does, yeah. So, so you should have cooled down by now in your fridge. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take two off. I'm confusing myself here because I'm doing two. Now, of course, you've only put two portions. That's right, yes. I can swing by afterwards and pick right, up the other two make portions if it's a problem. Okay. Let's, let's do that. Let's have a glass of wine together as well, eh? Although that would be breaking the law, so of course we would never do that. No, no, of course not. We'd never do that. No. Right. No. Spoonful of duck cell on the bottom of the pancetta. No, Crystal, the don't beans put your beans in just yet. I pulled my meat out. Yeah, 
So I see another question here from Mike. I'm just um, so Mike, is that are you the same Mike that cut himself earlier, perhaps while you were putting a plaster on? You didn't see what happened to the sherry. Yeah, the sherry got drunk. Half of it got drunk. As well it should. Right. What I've done is I've dabbed off the excess moisture from the beef. And then I'm going to place the beef on top of the duck cell. Right. Then I'm going to make a little roll. And I want to go around once and I'm going to take off the excess bacon or pancetta. So can you see that? It's almost like a little pig in like a lovely little parcel, thing. yeah. Mm. Now, I just say, here's a quick tip. If, um, if you are, if you, any of you banting is banting people watching, you can just put this back in the pan as it is now. Don't worry about the puff pastry. Exactly right. Right, let's place them on a tray. And for those of you that are doing four, I'm just gonna pause a little. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my puff pastry out. Give your board a nice wipe. And it talks. Okay. Um, so Luke, just to, just to, before we start with the pastry, can we, can we have another recap? We have one or two people who seem to, I don't know, lost the plot entirely, um, but one or two lagging behind. And uh, so if we could just have a quick recap before we get to the, the all important wrapping of the, of the Wellington. Okay, so what we've done, we've made the, we've made the mushroom duck cell. That was the first job we did. Onions, garlic, thyme, mushrooms in, Sherry in, reduce till dry, cream in, reduce, thicken, cool. Then we top and tailed our beans, the beans. We didn't take the tails off. We squared off beef and made it into those beautiful little rectangle shapes. And we saved the offcuts for uh, a nice ragu tomorrow. Question coming in. Yes, can we use three? Um, so the question is, do we uh, beef pancetta? Yes. That's it. That's where we should be at now. Okay, cool. I think. I think if you I'm haven't caught up by now, what I've got in the fridge. That's my, my fillet that's been seared, my mushroom mix onto the uh, pancetta, and then I roll the whole fillet in and I pop that back in the fridge. Whilst that's in the fridge, I'm going to work on my puff pastry. So I don't have anything about the cringe or what. Take the puff pastry out of the bag. You, you've got the plastic that is in between the sheets. It's going to 
help you to unroll that. I think uh, there's a question here about do we need to put flour down? I think this is why it's all important for that pastry to be cold because it's unlikely to stick to anything. If you're a little bit worried, you could put a little dusting of flour down on your board. But this is exactly why Luke was saying the, the, the pastry should be in the fridge because it's so much easier to work with when it's, when it's cold. But the, the flour, the flour, the flour is Right, so I'm going to use a ruler and I'm going to try and make this close to 18 centimeters by eight. So if you imagine a, a normal size ruler is 30 centimeters, it needs to be just over half that size. So we're going to make, again, a little belt. This is lovely puff pastry, I can see. The butter. So if you've got two, you need two pieces, or you need four pieces, four belts of puff pastry. This is too long. Just, just a matter of interest. I mean, I could you, cut you that in half, and it was still built. Because. I find that if I if I leave the sides open, then uh, some of that liquid drains out while it's cooking. Brilliant idea. So you need to work See, for quite me, that for me is because you don't want your. I mean, this kitchen is so hot, no extraction. I think I think that's that's genius. That that for me was I said was right, the, which, your egg which yolk the, the in little, a bowl. The, twist this is your glue yeah but i also think i think that's the twist is traditionally you'd, you'd fold it. it on all four sides like a parcel and and you're actually leaving the ends open i think that's genius yeah it, it works and it's it, it's actually easier it's easier to do it like that yeah so Definitely. look, I've got my puff pastry ready. I'm going to take away the third piece because I'm going to confuse people. Doing two. <laughs> I'm going to egg wash with my egg yolk the tip of my pastry. The top quarter. Can you see that? That's my we, glue. I think we've lost all. We seem to have, have lost your, 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 your board camera. Can you just, if, if you haven't wrapped them up yet, just lift up the piece of pastry so we can see the size of it. If you haven't wrapped them already. Okay, there we go. Cool. We're just reinstalling the board camera. Right. I'm going to place my beef and pancetta roll on the bottom of my puff pastry. And I'm going to roll it like a sushi roll. Okay. Yeah. In, in the same way you did with the pancetta. Can you see that, Pete? Can you see that on the... I can't, no. Oh, yes, here we go. We're back in business. Yes. I'm wrong. So the seam is down. It's going to okay, open the up bottom. when it's cooking it. Keep clean non-stick greaseproof paper on it, or if you don't have greaseproof paper,
So I just lost you there. Um, when you say if you don't have grease buffet, you just can we can just uh, uh, um, butter the the tray. A little bit of on the tray for Pete. Okay, that would work. Cool. If I do that again, I'm going to roll another one for you. And um, I'm just going to finish another one for the haven't quite seen. So egg yolk brushed over the top. I have to say, you know what that does remind me of, um, Luke, this is the world's most expensive sausage roll. I know. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pop that in the up in the uh, and I roll another one. I want to roll another one for people that might have missed out. So three pieces of pan and cheese, spoon of buck cell. Your seed, pretend it's seed. Mm -hmm. Roll it up. There's your beef in wrapped in pancetta. Then the puff pickle part, egg yolk, the top, that's your glue. Is that just to stick it at, at when you finally roll it up? That's exactly, that's just to stick it. And then you're going to roll your puff around like you would if you were making sushi rolls or sausage rolls. There you go, you see? Can you see that? Move it yeah, onto no, a tray. That, which is either it's either flowered, ideally got a non-stick paper, that's where we're at. No, Sharon, nothing is in the oven just yet. I wanted to. I wanted everyone to just have a look at that. Right. Right now, it's sauce time, Pete. This is where the magic happens. Okay. Just so can we recap? Just a recap. They look. Are the are the um are the Wellingtons in the oven? I'm going to uh, Wellington's in the oven now. Is everyone up to this point? If anyone's not up to this point, I think let's, then please let's just, just message in now. Let's, let's give, okay, cool. I think let's give them a couple of seconds to catch up while before we put them in. I think everyone's just going through the last rolling of the um, of the of the pastry. I think doing it a second time helped enormously from the, 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 the comments I can see. Um, but I think let's hold off. I think actually. I think you should put them in anyway um, because we need to crack on. People will catch up and we need to finish the sauce in time. If people take the, the Wellington out a little after yours, that's not a train smash. Let's commit, man. I'm going to sit in the stress free okay, position of the presenter over the glass of wine. Yeah. Okay, so now a water from Bring beans. your pot okay, of water back to the boil. I'm going to cook the beans in a minute, but I want to make the sauce first. I'm getting anxious. I want the sauce cooking. So, again, onions. Yes, good idea. Let's peel our onions like we learned to. You got your two baby 
For those of you who um, we're just going to recap where we are, Luke has put his um, Wellingtons in the oven at 200 degrees. That was that was that we asked you to heat your oven earlier, so it's straight in at 200 degrees. And now we are just going to start on the sauce. We've got our pot of water boiling for the beans to blanch the beans, but we need to uh, crack on with the sauce. And so Luke has just started by. Um, peeling his two small onions and going through the process of um, chopping again. Uh, Baz, yes, we do egg wash the top, give it that lovely golden brown finish. So don't forget the Wellington goes in for 16 minutes. And that will bring you out a medium rare to medium Wellington. If you want it cooked more, then put it in for 20 minutes for medium to medium well. So 16 right. minutes is optimal. I'm going to huh? slice my onion. Yeah, that's how I would do it. I'm going to slice my onion. Finally. I'm going to go through the diameter now. So, so again, we're looking at some nice, finely diced onions um, as, a, as an integral base of the sauce. As, as Luke said, the onions are the foundation to all of the cooking. Yes, uh, Mike, uh, chop the shallots, but keep an eye on those fingers. Um, we don't want any blood in the sauce. So... Um, Luke will be chopping now, then I think we go into the rest of the sauce, which is going to happen in a second. Um, we have some onions, some garlic, then we've got some beautiful aromatics. We've got lots and lots of black pepper going into that. And then we have a special pack that you've got ready mixed for you with uh, Worcestershire sauce, soy sauce, uh, a little bit of sherry, some red wine, and, and a bit of uh, a bit of bovril. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm, I love that video and I'm going to have a little taste of what you just saw. Oh, it certainly works for me. As I said, we're drinking the Gentle Giant from Haute Espoir, from my good friend Rob Armstrong in Franchuk, who makes the most delicious wines. Chardonnay is also worth a try, in fact. But this Gentle Giant that I'm drinking now is a is a blend of Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Cab Sap, uh, 2014. Something that Luke said would work perfectly with the Wellington. Uh, Cab Sap, something full body. This is the perfect wine for a lovely winter's evening, full body, rich, and will go lovely with something like the pastry, the mushrooms, and especially the spice of the pancetta. Um, we really do need to to um, to. If you need to take a moment to sip some wine, I'm going to certainly do that while we wait for Luke to resurface. I cheated and used my chopper for all the onions. Okay, your chopper. When you say your chopper, I hope you mean your cleaver, not one of those nasty, stirry kind of things that you use, your twister, because then you shouldn't be on this program if you're using a twister. Okay, so to recap where we are, we have our Wellingtons in the. We have our Wellingtons in the in the oven. Uh, Luke is just busy doing the basic prep for his sauce, so we can get the cafe au lait on business. We've prepped our beans. We've got some boiling water on the stove, but I think the beans are probably the thing we'll do last, so we can take them hot from the pot onto the plate. Um, and now it's just about making some sauce. 
So, and we have Luke back. Excellent, Luke. So I've been chatting while you were away um, about bits and pieces. Okay, so I'm going to carry on chatting because Luke can't hear me. Um, right. Um, okay, so moving swiftly along, Luke is still preparing to get his fabulous sauce on the go. Unmute the camera. I can hear you now. I'm back on and I'm ready with my the base to my sauce. So I've got chopped onions and thyme. Okay. Oh, I like the fact there's a there's a there's a common thread from the duxelle through to the sauce with the with the onions and the thyme. And we're back in business. Back. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah, apologise for that brief delay. It's it's hammering cats and dogs where we are, and it's playing havoc with our connectivity. So I do apologise for that short break. But we're back in action, and I think we're ready to 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 get cracking with our sauce. Look, we saw you chop your onions, um, and you were picking some thyme. Um, whereabouts are you on the sauce? Pete. Aha, good man. We're back. I can't hear you, but I'm going to carry on. So, as you can see, I'm working from this camera now. I've got my onions, my garlic, and my thyme in the pan. And I've fried them in a little bit of butter. So they're, again, exactly the same process as the duck cell. I'm frying them, a little bit of salt in there, some butter. I'm going to add my little sachet of black pepper. Let's mm -hmm. add half of that, and we can always add more later if we want. We don't want our sauce to be too peppery, but we want it to have a bite. So half a sachet of black pepper. Give that another little stir look. So we're drawing out those natural aromas from the from the pepper. C 
see this. This is your sachet full of goodies. So let's put, let's open that up using your scissors. Yeah. And I'm going to pour half of this onto my onion mix. And again, only half the pepper. That's exactly right. We can always add more pepper later if we want it to be stronger. I put half of my mix in and I'm keeping the rest just to add a little bit later if I need to. It's all about feeling. Making sauces is about feeling. There's thyme in the sauce, exactly right. So it's onions, garlic, thyme. Onions, garlic, thyme, cr crushed pepper. So what I'm doing now is I'm boiling that liquid with the onions, pepper, thyme, garlic. I'm boiling it over a fierce heat because I want to reduce it down. Let's check the timer. Three minutes. Boiling. My water for the beans is boiling. Exactly right, Fabio. The boiling is including half the sauce that's in the packet. Let's get some of these questions coming in. This is getting critical now. So beans into your boiling water, three minutes. What's James say? Oh. <laughs> right. So what we've got now is a reduction <laughs> of that liquid. It's boiling down. I'm going to show you. Can you see there? It's just, just starting to thicken up nicely. At that point, I'm going to take my sachet of cream. And I'm going to pour that into my sauce. Right, that's a good question, Gerrit. Um, you got your leftover onions and mushrooms here. You got a little bit of that sauce base left over, and you got the trimmings from your fillet. So why don't you fry tomorrow? You can fry the trimmings of your fillet, add your mushrooms, add your sauce base, add a little bit more cream if you've got it, and make yourself a nice stroganoff. Right, my sauce has got the cream in it. My beans are cooking. 
You need a strainer in the sink because you're going to strain your beans off in a minute. I'm going to taste my sauce. This is important. You need to taste because this is not an exact science. Tastes good. Nice kick of pepper. I'm glad I didn't put all the pepper in because different peppers, different strengths. Add all the cream. Exactly right, Mike. Just add all the cream to that reduced sauce base. Bring to the boil and boil for two to three minutes until slightly thickened. Right. Green beans. Green beans are cooked. They've been in for three minutes, three to four minutes. The key point of a green bean is to just bite it. If it squeaks a little bit when you bite it, then it's cooked. If it's too hard, leave it in for another minute. Beans are done. Let's just put a little bit of salt on them. A little bit of olive oil or butter. Keep them in a warm place. Don't put them in the oven. Just keep them in a If these go cold, you can always microwave them to heat them up again. Sauce. Two to three minutes. Boiling quite hard. I'm going to give it another taste. It should coat the back of a spoon. So put the spoon in and then run your finger along it. And if you see that that finger mark remains on the spoon, then your sauce is thick enough. Right, this is where the, the magic happens. Pete. Right. Um, ah, we're back. Excellent. Got one more minute on the 16-minute timer. Just open your oven and have a look. The pastry needs to be golden. If it's not golden, just turn your oven up a little bit to 210, 220. Give it a little blast to get that pastry nice and golden. So the key to a good beef wellington is golden pastry, perfectly cooked steak, and all the good stuff that you put in there. And of course, Luke, just to, correct me if I'm wrong. One more minute. A, a good wellington. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Time to just clean up my section. Because I'm going to have a nice clean board because I'm going to cut my meat, my wellington in half. I want to show everyone how well I've cooked it, he says nervously. Right. Is there any questions? Does anyone want to write in some questions that I can answer in the meantime while we're waiting for that last minute? Once the cream is added, you, you turn down the heat a little bit because you obviously don't want it to boil over. But let it boil so that it must rolling boil so it thickens. I said microwave. I know it's a swear word, but um, I, of course, won't use a microwave here. I'll reheat it in a pan if I need to. But I do use a microwave at home. There's my timer. 16 minutes. Let me go check them. Yeah, they're nicely cooked. So what you do now is just fill the edges. The edges, is you need like fingers of steel, but you just push the edges and it should have a little give, a little, um, a little bounce to it. It mustn't be soft like raw meat. We're going to let that rest. So what resting does is it lets that, that meat just calm down a little bit and the residual heat from the 
the residual heat from the, the cooking of the beef will then permeate all the way through and give you a nice even cooking degree. I'm going to transfer the meat. How crispy? My paste is nice and crispy on the top. And then the bottom will always be a little bit soggy because some of that moisture goes in there. But for me, that's one of the delights of a Wellington. That slightly soggy bit at the bottom that gets all the juice and all the sauce and, and then the nice crunchy bit on top. I'm transferring my meat onto a cool tray or a plate. And I'm going to put that with the beans. There you go. Don't forget the brandy. The brandy was in the mix. It was in the mega mix. This stuff. This has got brandy and wine in it. I don't suggest drinking it. Right, I turned around. My sauce is boiling like crazy. I got carried away talking there. Mike Bolton, yours looks amazing. I'm so happy, man. There you go, look. Sauce. Let's see how it coats the back of a spoon. Can you see that? What does it taste like? What does your sauce taste like? Mm. Mine's good. Now, again, a little bit of magic. I'm going to put half a pinch of sugar in my sauce because it just needs a little bit of calming down. Soggy bottom on the pastry. Some people say you can cook it on a, on a cooling wire. But in all honesty, there's always going to be a little bit of sogginess in there. Sugar, just to calm down that pepper in the sauce. Half a pinch. In the pan, give it a little stir. This is when you guys need to, like, use your own intuition a little bit. Mm. That's a good sauce. I'm happy with that. Is everyone happy? Is there any questions at this point? Wellingtons are looking amazing from Louder. Vanessa Nell, thanks, Chef. Looks incredible. This is great. I'm loving this. Right, so your Wellingtons have had a little rest. Right. Baz Caminada looks fabulous. Let me get a plate. I've got a nice test kitchen plate here. There you go. Haven't used one of these for a while. Right, let's place our meat on the chopping board. And we're just going to cut a little bit off the edges just to create a flat surface. You see, I've taken that much off. Nothing. That's creating a flat surface. And then I'm going to cut straight through the middle to reveal that cooking degree. Mine's a, a nice medium. Looks neat. I wish I could show you more carefully. Nice and pink, a little parcel. Grab my beans. I'm just going to lean my beans. Cafe Roux, I'm totally out of my depth, but loving it. That's so cool. Thanks, Dan. Beans, I'm leaning them. I want to give some height and some different angles to my 
food when I'm presenting it. In my delicious sauce, Carla, do you want to? Do you want to just focus down on this? I'm going to get Carla to focus down on it, so you can really see what's happening. So you've got your beef there, you've got your beans, and then you're just going to spoon some of the sauce onto the side. You don't want to put it all over the meat because you want everyone to see how well you cooked your meat. Do we strain the sauce? No, you keep all those good bits and pieces in the sauce. Is everyone comfortable? Does anyone need me to go over anything? Ours looks great, Chef. That's so cool. Thank you. Smells fab. Dinner in 15. Can't wait for next. Can't read that bit. Vanessa Nell, so delish. Are you already getting tucked in? I'm actually salivating. I'm starving. Tell him to tell me when to work. I say, Luke, it's fantastic. If you, if you think Luke is salivating me, wasn't it? Imagine how I feel because I don't have one of those to tuck into later. But I just like to say thank you. Just with regard to Luke's plating, plating, which looked fantastic. Of course, small secret is if you've overcooked the beef, then you definitely spoon the sauce over the meat so no one knows that you've overcooked it. But just a little tip that we won't let anyone in on. So a thing to remember, folks, we have a couple of prizes to give away. The first, and this is the beauty of buying a ticket. If you are just watching this live, you don't get the chance to win some fabulous prizes. The first is obviously a lucky ticket winner, which here we see is Helen Wood. So she will be having a lovely hamper of Hope Espoir wines. And our next prize, of course, goes to those of you who take photographs of your version of Chef Luke's dish. Plate it up, take a lovely, fantastic um, picture of it. Post it on Instagram. You've got to use the hashtag, hashtag live cook channel if you want to be in line to win a case of Haute Espoir wines. It really is something you cannot miss. And of course, we all know Instagram today, your food doesn't exist unless it's on Instagram. So make sure you take a fantastic picture of that beef wellington that you've just slaved over the past hour and a half to make sure that we see them and we will decide who is the most fabulous picture and we will send you a case of Hocus Bowl wines. Remember folks, we're going to be doing this every two weeks. Our next chef up is my very, very good friend, Benny Masekwameng, my partner in crime through four seasons of South African MasterChef and two seasons of Ultimate Prime Master. He is my Joburg connection. And he will be joining us in a couple of weeks' time with a fantastic grilled salmon trout dish. Benny is known for his seafood dishes. It's his personal favorite. And if you want to join us, please go to Web Tickets but before the 3rd of July, where you can book to cook. Right. And so that is about us for today. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much to Luke for what has only been, for me, a fantastic dish. I'd like to raise a glass to our chef for the evening and say thank you, Luke, and thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time on the Live Cook channel. May the sauce be with you.